Hey guys, it's Hunter. Welcome back to another episode of Ask Fish. This is the ideally weekly series where we answer some of your most burning questions on Discord. So don't forget to join if you've got a question for a future episode. Link will be in the pinned comment and in the description. You guys had some great questions that sent me down multiple deep rabbit holes. And there's so much interesting story and context to share with you guys. A lot to talk about, so smack a like on the video if you're going to enjoy it. For every like, I will give Pringle a pet, which I was gonna do anyways. Okay, after we finish guitars. But the like button actually really helps feed the YouTube algorithm. All that waffle out of the way, let's jump into your questions. Ozzy Richmond rocket emoji science test tube emoji asks, has anyone seen the possible prototype for an Epiphone mic Durnt grabber? Ew, bass. Nah, but in all fairness, this is actually pretty cool. Mike Durnt of Green Day has been seen with a new Epiphone bass, a Silver Burst Grabber G3, one of Gibson's lesser known bass shapes he was known for playing in the early to mid 90s Dookie era. So what the hell even is the grabber bass? Well, like most weird looking and lesser celebrated Gibson shapes, this this story starts in the Norlin era. Gibson were doing a ton of wacky experimentation in the 70s and the 80s, and on the bass side, that included the L9S Ripper, the Grabber, and the Grabber G3. Now, personally, they're not particularly good looking with the big ass body and small flying V headstock, but the regular Grabber is particularly special because it's got this crazy sliding pickup that you can literally grab get it, and move forward or back along the track for different tones. They even made a fretless version at one point for an even more slide factor. The Grabber G3 that Mike Durnt plays though has three single coil pickups where the middle is wired out of phase with the neck and the bridge, essentially meaning with a three-way pickup selector, you've got a neck humbucker with the neck and middle single coils, a bridge humbucker with the bridge and middle single coils, or you can use all three of them as just a big ass three coil pickup, what Gibson coined a buck and a half. It's crazy though, because Norland instruments used to be super undesirable. They were known as the shit ones. And now they're collector's items. The prices are getting pretty insane, especially when it comes to the bases because they're particularly rare. So Epiphone have done affordable Ripper reissues before, once in the late 90s made in Korea, the other in 2007-ish made in China. But Epiphone's never done an accessibly priced grabber base production run, which makes what Mike Dern's been playing very, very interesting. Not only is Epiphone finally doing an import grabber, but the photos also show Mike Dern's name written on the truss rod cover. So in my truly expert YouTuber commentator opinion, that's pretty solid confirmation that this is in fact a signature prototype. And this will also be the first time there's been a factory silver burst grabber option as well. Gibson added silver burst in 1979. So not only is that a cool combination of features, but it's a nice nod to the overall Norlin era as well. As for price, well, Epiphone hasn't done any bases as part of their new premium tier inspired by Gibson custom collection yet. They've actually only done one non-guitar collection collaboration with the custom shop and that's randomly been the F5G mandolin with a compound radius ebony fingerboard and mother of pearl inlays. Bluegrass, f yeah. I wish they'd done those specs on the Mando bird too, together with the full size guitar pickup, wild. Anyway, so if I had to guess, these Durnt G3s will be at the same tier level and price the same as the Rex Brown Thunderbird at $12.99. But that's based on absolutely nothing besides that when they finally do drop inspired by Gibson custom bases, they'd probably launch some with the most iconic shape. In my mind, that's Thunderbird, so maybe a 63 Thunderbird 2, or their very first successful solid body base, like a 1959 EV-0 reissue. Not some Norlin experiment, even if it is a signature model for a high profile artist. And these are just rumors, so take them with a grain of salt, but I've been hearing many rumblings from my base friends that in addition to the Durant G3 signature that Epiphone is heavily rumored to be reissuing the normal one pickup grabber 2 later this year. It's allegedly going to be in the original black and natural colors, and again, first time they've ever done that. But the rumors also say that, disappointingly, the single pickup will not be movable. And for a lot of bases, that completely misses the point of the grabber model. Speaking of which, it seems that 982,730% of viewers have missed the subscribe button. So here's your quick reminder to go ahead and hit that if you haven't already so you don't miss any new guitar content. We're so close to hitting 200,000 subscribers. It's crazy. Massive thanks to everyone who's done that so far. But I wouldn't be surprised if every bit of that grabber rumor turns out to be true. Epiphone did something similar earlier this year with a heavy focus on Thunderbird bases, dropping Rex Brown's signature first to initially hype up the shape, 
followed by the Thunderbird 64s to keep that hype train going. They also have a habit of slightly missing the point with Norlin reissues, standardizing the specs instead of preserving the wackiness in full. One example from the guitar side of things, the original 70s RD had a 25 and a half inch scale length longer than a normal Gibson, but every reissue since has had the Gibson standard 24 and 3 quarter inch scale length. Now obviously it's great that they still show the underappreciated Norlin model some love, but come on bro, the slightly different features like that extra 3 quarter inches of chug potential for the RD is a huge part of what makes those wacky Norlin experiments so cool. And in Gibson's mind, probably why they didn't sell so well, so you can see where they're coming from. On a completely separate note, uh, I know that Kramer is the ginger illegitimate stepchild in the Gibson family, but if they are starting to put a heavier emphasis on basses this year, it'd be cool if they also took the opportunity with Mike Durnt to reissue the Kramer 250B, another bizarre 70s bass he's famously played, like at Woodstock 1994, as his G3 was undergoing repairs. Those old aluminum Kramer necks are super fucking heavy, so the thing probably weighs about 12 million pounds, give or take, but if they ghost contracted Illuminati or someone to do a limited run of chambered aluminum neck bases. I mean, there's exactly a 0% chance of that ever happening, but it's fun to dream and it'd be pretty dope. Anyways, uh, talking about Kramer bases is a sign that this thing is starting to go a bit off the rails. And this is a long time to talk about bass, so here's where I'm gonna throw it to you. What do you think of the Mike Dirt signature of Epiphone finally releasing grabber bases of the grabber and ripper bass family overall? Any and all thoughts, drop them down below. Ciao, Purple Evertune Gang asks, dude, PRS brought back the old NF3 for the SE line. What do you think about it? Man, PRS have been on an absolute tear recently with the SE line, adding import versions of formerly exclusive models like the McCarty 594s, the Swamp Ash Special, the DGT, the CE24s. They've even upgraded the specs of staple production models like adding ebony fingerboards to the custom 24s. And they've been going especially hard with bolt-ons recently, the SE Silver Sky, the 499 CE24 Standard Satin, which by the way, video in the cards if you want to watch after this video, it's awesome. And all that leads us back to the new SE NF3. It combines both things I just said about the SE line. The NF3 was a bolt-on model that PRS made alongside the very similar DC3 as part of their premium American built core series from about 2011 to 2015. And this is the first time that the NF3 has been available as an accessibly priced import, which is apparently the theme of this week's episode. The NF3 comes in metallic orange, gunmetal gray, pearl white, and ice blue with your choice of either a rosewood or a maple fingerboard, which in my opinion is the better looking option with the abalone bird inlays. So sick. I'm a huge fan of that ice blue in particular. The bodies are made of poplar and it's a bit of a shame they weren't able to do Karina, aka white limba like the originals had, but limba tends to be expensive to work with because it's toxic. <laughs> and generally speaking, Poplar actually has about the same weight and hardness as Limba does. So in terms of feel, that should theoretically be a great alternative while keeping the price under $1,000. Poplar is kind of an unfair reputation for being a shitty hardwood because it's relatively inexpensive and you find it a lot on the very, very, very affordable guitars. And it is quite soft, so it damages easier than other hardwoods but it's not terrible, and in this case, it makes sense. But anyways, the key feature of this new guitar is the pickup set, and they're so essential to the identity of the model that PRS has it in the name. NF stands for narrow field pickup, and the concept behind these, in PRS's own words on the website, was to, quote, take the unique tone of a well-made, great-sounding single coil and combine that with the positive characteristics of a humbucker pickup. The idea was that by making a super narrow humbucker, you'd capture a more focused sound of the strings like you do with the single coil, and at the same time, you'd also get a fuller sound and hum canceling like you do with a humbucker. Now, I am not a strat person at all. Full humbucker, volume and tone to 10, fat, saturated chug tones only, baby. So while I've listened to the demos on PRS's channel, I still have no idea whether this actually sounds like a proper stratty tone or not, but I think it sounds very pleasant. Have a listen. <laughs> So what do you think? Stratty, but with more body? Not stratty at all? Strat experts, drop your opinions down below. But after being mainly a set neck guy for most of my guitar playing life, I've been entering somewhat of a bolt-on phase recently. Perfect timing, because all these sick bolt-ons are coming to the SE line. But something that was a bit of a bummer with the SE version of the CE24 
is that it didn't keep the bolt-on design that the core CE24 has. On the American CE24s, the connecting position is almost like it is on their set necks. It just so happens to be fastened in by four bolts rather than glue. For the SE CE24, it's been rounded for comfort, but yeah, it's pretty much a standard bolt-on block. There's nothing wrong with that, it's just not the unique, modern, elegant design that's part of what makes the CE24 so special. Naturally then, the back was one of the first things I checked, and the SE NF3 does have that same vintage-inspired bolt-on joint, but in this case, again, it actually makes sense. This is a much more traditional Strat-inspired guitar, and it's also what the American NF3 had, so the affordable version is staying very true to its roots. Love to see it. I'll be honest though, the NF3 is not my favorite PRS model, but again, I love how we're getting so many different flavors of PRS in the accessible SE line recently. In fact, it's gotten so good that PRS have basically forced themselves to upgrade the S2s, so they have the exact same American Electronics and Nitro finishes for the same tone and feel, as the $4,500 core models just in pared down designs. Some have argued that's what S2 should have always been, but we move. Really what I want to know now is where the hell is the Miles Kennedy SE? The push-pull pod to set the tone in that perfect sweet spot for leads? That thing is outrageously cool. We need an SE version, he says as a totally non-biased and unabashedly shameless Alter Bridge fan. With how quickly PRS is adding import versions of the US models, especially focusing on bolt-ons, I have no doubt this is something they're working on right now. Now, a bit of a nerdy guitar history lesson, because as usual, I went way too far down an ADHD-fueled rabbit hole researching the NF3 and have to info dump to somebody. Hopefully at least one of you gives a shit. But prior to 2018 Silver Sky, PRS had been experimenting with Strat-style guitars, even as early as 1990 with the EG series. PRS had for these kind of the same goal as they did for the CE24s, in that they still wanted to deliver super high quality guitars, but by making them bolt-on, they might be able to shave some time it took to build them, and then they could price them more accessibly, get more people into the world of PRS. Turns out though, for their ultra high quality standards, it took them almost as much time to build a bolt-on as it did a set neck, but that's a separate story, we move. It was just interesting to see going through the old catalogs, that especially with models like the EG3 and EG4, you can see the beginnings of the idea that would eventually give us the NF3. Somehow everyone just forgot about them and nobody gave PRS for making a Strat until 2018. Just thought that was interesting and wanted to share because PRS does a lot of tweaking and experimentation. So there are a lot of these short-lived series like the EG that have been kind of lost to time and they're also underappreciated on the used market, maybe because a lot of people don't even know to search for them. So yeah, if you're interested in the NF3, I've got Sweetwater and Toman links in the description, as well as links to all the other gear we've been talking about. But if you're interested in the NF3s, the EG series might also be something to look at. Anyways, info dump on a series you didn't even ask about over. This is where I'll throw the original question to you. What do you think of the SE version of the NF3? And what do you think of what PRS is doing with their SE line recently? I'd love to hear any and all thoughts down below. And it's great answering questions from you guys. Jordan puts a ton of editing hours into these, making sure there's visual context for everything. So now it's time to hear from yet another adoring fan. It's the high praise of the week. Who cares? You're nothing but a YouTuber and full of most of the time anyways. <laughs> Fair points, that's high praise. But that will do it for this week's episode of Ask Fish. Don't forget to join our server if you have a question for a future episode. And if you missed the last episode, we talked about the new Guild Polara line and why these seemingly boring Gibson SG clones are actually a huge deal with some massive behind the scenes players. And if you missed the one before that, we talked about what Fender is not telling you about the much hyped Tom DeLonge Starcasters. Links to all those in the cards and in the description. Huge thanks to my amazing supporters on Patreon who make each and every video possible. Their names are up on the screen right now. You can become a patron to add your name as well as get bonus extras. You can also join as a channel member or pick up some comfy ass merch. Every bit helps grow the channel. Social media, Discord, and links to all the gear we talked about are in the description. As always, thank you so much for watching. You've been awesome, and I will see you for the next video.